Hello and welcome to all the attendees to today's session, Driving Security into Your Business, How to Leverage Zero Trust to Address FWA by Speaker John Kapsitsky, Director of Information Security Transformation, Freddie Mac. I am Seema Singh and I will be your host for the day. Please note, the session will be in listen-only mode and will last for 40 minutes, out of which the last 10 will be dedicated to the Q&A, requesting all the participants to post questions in the Q&A window. Should you need any assistance during the session, please use the chat box. Also, if you face any audio video challenges, please check your internet connections or you may log out and log in again. A very important announcement for the certificate of attendance. The participant need to attend the complete webinar to qualify for the certificate of attendance. The participant should fill in the survey form in the attendees thank you mail and answer the three questions based on the webinar provided speaker with the right answer within the same day. If these two criteria are met, then only the participant will receive the certificate of attendance within, the, within five to seven working days after the event. About our speaker, John leads the Freddie Mac's information security transformation team to help execute the firm's cyber agenda and corporate cyber goals by building and improving internal processes and technology environments. Over the last two decades, John has built and improved information security organizations and aligned the cyber agenda towards evolving business and technology programs by providing greater visibility and understanding of changing risks. Additionally, he has helped many firms to understand how to align their cyber agenda with dynamic business and compliance priorities. So now without any further delay, I would now hand over the session to you, John. Thank you, Seema, I appreciate it. Um, so uh, again, my, my name is John Kapsinski. I'm a Director of Information Security Transformation uh, here at Freddie Mac. Uh, so I, I have two decades of information security experience, uh, primarily within the areas of financial services, governance, consulting, mergers and acquisitions, and healthcare. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, so over the course of these two decades, I've uh, helped deliver over 100 projects and cyber capabilities, and I've seen trends emerge over the time you know, everything from supply chain attacks to how to be able to move actionable intelligence uh, through leveraging threat intel outside of the scene, uh, uh, moving from, orchestra uh, uh, from orchestration and uh, moving towards orchestration and automated response. And obviously the, the evolving compliance mandates, including GDPR, CCPA, CC, uh, CMMC, and FFIEC. And also, uh, 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 importantly, the reemergence and recalibration of ransomware attacks that we've seen within the news recently as well. Uh, I do need to state that uh, obviously all the opinions here and viewpoints are my own and should not be attributed to that of my employer. Uh, this is also the first time that I'm giving this talk and so obviously feedback uh, and dialogue is welcome of course and so I appreciate that. Um, what do I hope to be uh, what do I hope people get out of today's presentation? Uh, so again we want to be able to define the problem so what is fraud waste and abuse and how big is that problem? Uh, so what's the scale size and scope of fraud waste and abuse within uh, 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 within our area? Uh, what are the broad brush elements uh, uh, associated with zero trust? Uh, so we'll, we'll highlight uh, uh, zero trust using some metaphors, uh, uh, but also some technical examples to be able to highlight this approach and strategy. Um, and then finally, how can zero trust be, uh, be leveraged to be able to address fraud, waste, and abuse? Uh, um, one, one of the other things I want to be able to say is that this, this talk is about 30 to 35 minutes or so. Uh, we can easily spend a week talking through all the different salient points below. And so I, I, I'm going to try to go fairly quickly, but but obviously if there are other questions or comments, and feel free to be able to link me in or to be able to have a, and be able to start a dialogue offline as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so, so talking about why is it important to be able to have this conversation now? Uh, so as we can see from the Verizon DVIR uh, report over here on the top left hand uh, uh, left hand side, uh, uh, financial crimes are on the rise uh, and have continued to be on the rise. And so we've obviously seen fairly fairly flat line with with respect to other as well as espionage, but obviously financials uh, financial financially motivated attacks are are continuing to be able to increase. 
Uh, obviously, within the last year, uh, we've seen there, uh, uh, you know, there's been a dramatic and seismic shift to remote working since March 2020 because of the pandemic. And because of that, obviously, organizations are more dependent upon technology now than ever before. So you can you can no longer go down the down the hallway to be able to tap your colleague on the shoulder. Uh, to be able to ask questions or to be able to interact and so obviously we're we are we are tied and tethered to our uh, to our to our technology and workstations in order to be able to complete work uh, uh, so that our, our firms are able to be able to continue to be able to uh, uh, be productive and in, in this new normal obviously there is a return to work that's happening now as as organizations are moving back into the office but but for a lack of for 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 better for all intents and purposes, this is you know the remote working environment is going to con uh, continue and persist for a while now. Um, additionally, uh, fraud, waste, and abuse use cases traditionally reflects one of the lowest or no risk appetites within an organization. Um, so to adequately manage fraud, waste, and abuse, a close alignment is required between prevention, detection, mitigation process, and a risk appetite that takes into consideration both external oversight uh, uh, as well as the risk culture of an organization and alignment to risk accountability so the three lines of defense uh, control effectiveness and risk transparency so data and metrics and reporting um, so while while there is some level of acceptance for financial loss there is often zero risk appetite for reputational impact uh, or risk facing regulatory or government inquiry as it relates to fraud, waste, and abuse. And so, again, as we're looking at you know, uh, kind of that risk appetite to be able to define what exactly is fraud, waste, and abuse. And so, there's there's little appetite for uh, for for certain certain activities to be able to happen both externally and internally within the organization because of the reputational impact and also the regulatory. Uh, However, the lower appetite for fraud risk and losses uh, tends to lead to a greater number of coverage of processes in place to be able to address kind of those high risk areas. And so obviously, the lower the risk appetite, the higher the controls need to be able to be on the other side to be able to make sure that that proper coverage is 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 being addressed from that from the appetite perspective. Um, to this point, uh, we've obviously seen a significant rise in the disruptive nature of attacks that have garnered worldwide attention so none more significant than the recent rise in ransomware attacks and so all these items on the right hand corner uh, are all news snippets that have uh, that have come up within the last quarter and so everything from the colonial pipeline again targeting oil uh, the cost paid was 4.4 million dollars in bitcoin then we have uh, Brentag, which is again chemical uh, uh, industry, costs 4.4 million dollars in terms of the ransomware. Acer was also hit in May 2021. Uh, uh, JBS Foods, Quanta, the National Basketball Association was also uh, was also a target as well. Uh, AXA and CAN were also part of a you know their their insurance uh, large insurance providers, and so they were targeted. Um, uh, and the entertainment industry was targeted as well. So both EA as well as CG, uh, CD Projekt uh, uh, were also targeted uh, in February 2021 and also EA recently as well. And so the entertainment industry is not not uh, is also susceptible to to these types of attacks. Kia Motors, so from the automotive perspective, are also also targeted uh, uh, was also targeted back in February. And so again, these are front page of the you know front page of the Washington Post, front page of the New York Times, front page of international media uh, uh, in terms of activities that happen uh, that 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 all all reflect obviously reputational and uh, 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 reputational impact to organizations but also bottom line in terms of the costs associated with 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 not just paying a ransom but also fixing the, the the controls in place that 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 allowed these attacks to be able to occur in the first place um, so these attacks were obviously made play uh or these attacks were made possible due to a confluence of events um so obviously the rise in commoditized not ransomware as a service uh the change in the tools techniques and procedures uh, uh, uh which includes not just encrypting business critical systems and data but also expelling data as uh, as a part of the threat of a release that relates to ransomware uh the continual rise in cryptocurrency uh, uh, cryptocurrency popularity so the ability to be able to purchase goods and services so my my local convenience store actually has a bitcoin atm uh, and there are people out there purchasing cars and and, and houses with with cryptocurrency uh, and so obviously th this is becoming more mainstream in terms of the ability to be able to access purchase and transfer cryptocurrency uh, 
But before we get too far in the presentation, I want to be able to make sure that we operationally define fraud, waste, and abuse. So obviously, these are these are attacks that have obviously made made it to the front page of the Washington Post. We can show kind of the Verizon DVIR in terms of the financial crimes that are on the rise. Uh, we've seen you know statements over here in terms of inspector generals, in terms of you know where 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 a number of investigations are happening. Uh, but fraud is again as as a definitional statement the the wrongful or criminal deception intended to result in financial or personal gain. Uh, waste is defined as a thoughtless or careless expenditure, mismanagement, or abuse of resources to a detriment of the firm. And abuse is defined as excessive or improper use of a thing. So uh, which can, uh, which, uh, or, or to use something in a manner contrary to the natural or legal use for that, for that, for that purpose. Um, finally, to bring it home. So, uh, where and how we work has changed rapidly and, and, and radically. And those changes and our dependency on technology and exposure to cyber threats has increased as well. And so obviously, as we look at the, the ability to be able to protect ourselves against fraud, waste, and abuse, we need to be able to look at where are the emerging trends in the industry to be able to uh, uh, be able to address the, the, the heightened risk associated with, 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 with these actors. So. Next slide, please. So who's perpetrating these, these, these actions? And so again, we wanna be able to talk a little bit about the adversaries. We're not gonna spend too much time here, uh, uh, but from a cyber threat actor perspective, uh, cyber threat actors are not equal in terms of capability, sophistication. They have a range of resources, training, support for their activities. Cyber threat actors sometimes can can operate on their own or as part of a large organization. So, for example, sometimes nation states may work with organized crime groups. Uh, sometimes even sophisticated actors may may use less sophisticated tools and techniques because these are free or easily available or makes them difficult for defenders to be able to attribute activity. Um, so nation states are frequently the most sophisticated actors and threat groups, and so these have dedicated resources, personnel, and extensive planning and coordination. Some nation states have uh, operational relationships with private sectors and other organized criminals. Uh, cyber criminals are generally understood to have moderate sophistication in terms of, uh, of uh, in comparison to nation states. Uh, nonetheless, they still have planning and support functions in addition to specialized uh, technical capabilities that that affect uh, uh, a large number of victims. And again, hacktivists, terrorist groups, and thrill seekers are typically at the lower end of the spectrum. Uh, and they're, they're, they have available tools uh, uh, that, that require a little technical skill to be able to deploy, but uh, their actions are often not, not financially motivated, uh, but again, are, are primarily reputational impacts or, or try to be able to uh, no long lasting uh, effects except for beyond beyond reputation. So insider threats, again, at the bottom of the group. And so this over here is a important group for us to be able to talk about as part of the fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, so insider threats are individuals working within an organization who are particularly dangerous because, again, they have access to internal networks uh, that are protected at the security perimeters. Access is a key component for, for actors to be able to have access to privilege, ac uh, you know, privilege access, which eliminates the 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 need to employ other remote means. So, so again, if they're already inside the new organization, then then we, they don't need to be able to look for external uh, methods and means to be able to be able to infiltrate and exfiltrate information. Uh, so, insider threats may be associated with other other types, obviously. So, there might be an insider threat that's also associated with a nation state, or insider threats also associated with organized criminal, uh, organized crime, and so on and so forth. So, um, all right, next slide. So outside of some of the larger examples on the previous slide, so as we talked about kind of the large, you know, front page of the Washington Post uh, and, and you know, New York Times attacks, you know, as it relates to Colonial and JBS and uh, Kia and NBA. So the, it, fraud, waste and abuse can also be much more nuanced and, and, and persistent. It doesn't always need to be flashing lights. It doesn't always need to be on sirens or encrypted hard drives asking for ransomware payments in Bitcoin within 72 hours. Sometimes rent, uh, fraud, waste, and abuse is small and incremental. 
So when looking at kind of the sampling distribution uh, of, of transitions, uh, or transactions across web-facing applications, it's fairly easy to be able to write business logic to be able to identify potentially fraudulent activity. So for example, here are some common ones, you know, the billing information is different than the contact information. So several small or unusually large transactions are made in a very short period of time. Or maybe you're you're trying to be maybe there's somebody who's trying to be able to buy something that's easily accessible within that that that, that particular location or or country. Um, so the, the the common online fraud list that you see over here to the right hand corner is indicative of examples that you might see uh, that that which which sit outside of the normal standard deviation of the transaction. So the, these activities do not necessarily mean that there is fraud happening. Uh, however, the risk is elevated and the application may ask, you know, potentially for step up authentication to be able to ensure you are who you say you are. Um, as an example, again, it's easier to be able to identify fraudulent transactions through a misplaced comma or a decimal point. So the, the, the typical, you know, the typical purchase is say $100 and then now there's a purchase for $10,000. So, um, uh, uh, then, then obviously that, that, that step falls outside of the realm of, of of uh, regular uh if they're uh uh but there might might uh, but sometimes there are small and incremental changes so which may not seem out of the ordinary so maybe a routing number changes or there's a modified email on a contact list or maybe there is a a new authorized user on the account and so all normal normal under under certain situations and likely to be able to raise potential concerns so with with that being said how can organizations continue to be able to minimize their attack surface while, while also providing more nuanced and robust notifications? Next slide. Uh, so consider the airport as a model for zero trust. Um, I think we can all agree that there are, phys that there are fewer physical high traffic locations that have a lower risk appetite than the airport. So an airport, uh, there, there, is, there is little to no uh, uh, appetite for an event that, you know, to either happen on an airplane or within the terminal. And so obviously there's a lot of security and a lot of protective measures that go into place to be able to ensure that, uh, uh, that passengers and the flight crew and the personnel who are moving through, uh, moving through the concourse and the terminals are, are, are safe. Um, so in the graphic to the left, it shows kind of the traditional passenger screening of the model in the airport. All passengers pass through the airport security checkpoint uh, to, to access the, the boarding gates. In a zero trust terms, this is the policy decision point, policy enforcement point. So everyone must pass through this entry point. No one is, um, uh, no one is trusted to be able to circumvent. Everybody goes through the gate, everybody gets scanned. And so once through, uh, the passengers and the airport employees and the aircraft crew uh, can all mill about in the terminal area and all the individuals are considered trusted. Uh, uh, in this model, the implicit trust zone is the, is the boarding area. So from a policy decision, policy enforcement uh, 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 perspective, this applies to a set of controls uh, uh, so that all traffic beyond this, this policy enforcement point has a common level of trust. So the policy decision, policy enforcement cannot apply to additional policies beyond the, tra uh, the, beyond the location of the flow of traffic. And so, for example, once you are authorized to be able to enter, so you are at this minimum level of security in terms of trust uh, that, that, that you've been afforded through, through entering into this area. Uh, so, but to be able to allow the, the policy decision and enforcement point to be as specific as possible, it's important to be able to have the implicit trust zone be as small as possible. So and this is one of the tenants, obviously, of zero trust. Uh, this this brings us to the crux of what zero trust is. It, it it's a security model. Uh, it's a set of design uh, principles based upon an acknowledgement that threats exist both inside and outside of the traditional network boundaries. Zero trust uh, repeatedly questions the premise that a user device network component should be implicitly trusted based upon their location in their network. It also embeds comprehensive security monitoring. Um, uh, uh, granular, dynamic, risk-based access control, uh, security automation, um, uh, and also it is a data-centric security model that allows for the concept of least privilege to be applied for every access decision where the answer to the question of who, what, when, where 
and how are critically important uh, are critical for appropriately allowing for the design of access to resources. So over the next few slides, we'll return to the airport metaphor and its relationship with zero trust. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is also where we need to be able to make a qualification statement. Right. Zero trust is not a silver bullet. Uh, it does not replace the need for proper side, uh, cyber hygiene. Uh, you still need to patch, still need to rotate passwords, still need to assess risk, detect, deter, respond, and recover to events. Uh, so consider zero trust an enhancement on your existing security program where there are needs related to your organization's risk appetite. Uh, but, so this includes obviously coordinating an aggressive system monitoring, assuming that all requests for resources and all network tra traffic may be malicious and assuming all devices and infrastructure may be compromised. Ex uh, accepting that all access approvals to critical resources incur risk. Um, so the following uh, is a list of you know several zero trust concepts, uh, which the next few slides will cover. And so we'll talk a little bit about fine grain authentication. A multi-factor authentication, uh, enhanced monitoring. So again, we're going to very uh, because of the shortness of this this talk, we're going to very specifically talk about user behavior analytics. Um, also, because it applies very well into into kind of the the, the airport metaphor. We're going to talk a little about micro segmentation. Note there are other capabilities and other features that can be discussed here, but again, for the purposes of the time allowed, we can only really focus on a couple. Uh, and, and I felt that these were probably appropriate for the for the time frame that we had. Um, Ultimately, the, the elements of zero trust enhancements can help uh, address fraud, waste, and abuse by minimizing the attack surface and the blast radius associated with attacks, as well as providing deeper interrogation of activity uh, to identify anomalies quicker and with greater accuracy. Cool. Right. Next slide. So fine green authentication, fraud, waste, and abuse cases. So. So continuing again with the airport uh, zero trust model. So so upon the TSA arriving to the security gate uh, and uh, uh, they will subject passengers to a number of inspections uh, to ensure that they should be granted access to the terminal. Uh, uh, so they'll, they'll look at user attributes. So the, the inspection typically includes, you know, the, the passenger presenting the boarding pass to the TSA agent and we'll check to make sure that the, the name is the same that it appears on the driver's license. Uh, object attributes. So does a passenger meet the minimum age for flying? Do they require assistance to, to move up, uh, move about the concourse? Do they look like the picture on their identification? Uh, so these are all object attributes. Action attributes. Um, as the passenger passes through the security checkpoint, uh, are, are, are there any qualified exceptions that this individual qualifies for? Are they, are they a, a, a nursing mother and, and require to, to bring breast milk onto the, onto the airport, onto, into, the, into the restricted area? Are they, are they law enforcement uh, and are, are authorized to be able to bring firearms into, into, into the airport? Uh, are, does the individual require a service animal as a part of, uh, as part of their, uh, their transport that day, you know, and to be able to bring authorized pets in, in, into airplanes. Um, so again, these are all action attributes that are associated uh, uh, with um, these are all action attributes associated with what information is being done to the data uh, uh, by the subject, including reading, editing, approving, and deleting. And then finally, environmental attributes. So. Uh, are you on a no-fly list? Uh, is the ticket for the registered airline in the terminal, uh, uh, in that terminal, and for a flight that day? For example, are you presenting a a a a, a ticket for a a flight that is that is to take off that day, or was that flight you know two weeks ago, or yesterday, or tomorrow? And so we want to be able to make sure that the environmental attributes are appropriate to be able to gain access into the terminal. So again, as we're looking across again, user attributes, object attributes, action attributes, environmental attributes, and then we look at the the policy again, a set of rules stating for the permission of restriction to 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 access that terminal, uh, uh, the TSA agent is is the is the policy enforcement policy decision point to be able to enter into the terminal, and so the TSA agent will grant access based upon a predefined set of policies, and so that for all intents and purposes is really what what policy based or fine grain authentication within 
uh, within this context would mean. So, but similarly, authentication can be configured to be appropriately fine-grained and allow users access to a resource based upon predefined set of policies. Uh, to the left, uh, we have the solar winds, uh, uh, kind of a simplified attack. And uh, so what I want to do is obviously bring this to something that was recent. And so, uh, 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 so as we walk through again, the, the, as the attacker works their way through the organization. So again, there was, uh, you know, supply, supply chain attack, the execution of persistence, defense, invasion, recon, initial command and control and exfiltration. So as we move down to hands-on keyboard attacks, so once the attacker gained access to the network, with the compromised credentials, they were moving, they, they attempted to be able to move laterally using multiple different credentials. Uh, the credentials used for lateral movement were always different uh, and, and, and from, uh, from those they also use, uh, 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 also different from the ones they use from, from remote access. Um, so since a, a valid but unauthorized security token and account were utilized, detecting this activity would, would require again, a maturity and monitoring. Uh, for uh, to identify actions that were outside of a user's normal duties. For example, it was unlikely that a, a, a it was unlikely that a, a an account associated with somebody in HR uh, would need to be able to have access to cyber a cyber threat intelligence database. So, from a fine grain authorization perspective, limiting access to control rights to least privilege would have potentially mitigated some of the efforts in terms of lateral movements. Uh, 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 as well as provided an, ab um, an avenue to identify anomalous activity for, for example, you know, a single machine attempting to be able to authenticate with multiple credentials that were outside of the, you know, outside the realm of normal. Uh, so again, it, it, the fine grain authentic authentication wouldn't have obviously prevented the solar wind attack, but it would significantly have reduced the attack surface again if, if policy-based authentication were in place with the with the attack with with the credentials that the attacker would have had access to. Moving down. Uh, next slide, please. So as, as we continue with the airport metaphor, um, when a passenger approached his various checkpoints in the airport, uh, they're asked to be able to provide identification. So, so provide and your plane ticket. So something you have and something you are. Uh, uh, this works as kind of the initial security checkpoint, but all to get into the terminal, but also through customs, through the frequent flyer suite, through the boarding gates, et cetera, et cetera. And so sometimes you might be asked for different types of credentials to pass through certain areas. So for example, if you're, if you're an airport worker, you may be asked to be able to provide a pin code for a door or a separate badge to be able to get into a, a different restricted areas. So again, MFA is something you have and something you are. So uh, attackers may be using phishing, social engineering, or a combination of attacks to be able to, to attain credentials of a valuable account. Uh, this is something you are. Uh, however, if that attacker is unable to be able to get access to something something you have, like for example a token, uh, uh, they will be in, unable to be able to proceed further. Um, so, what's also important to be able to note here is, and uh, I call it out here in the slide, uh, is that it's important from from an organizational perspective to be able to understand what you consider valuable, and so. For that what your definition of a valuable may be very different what a what a uh, what a an at an attacker's motivation may be interested in. so for an example an administrative account may be valuable to you as an or, as an organization but attacker may be also very interested in financial gain and maybe consider accounts that have access to financial or payment resources of equal or maybe even greater value uh, so as you're looking to be able to apply multi-factor authentication to to applications uh, look, look across not just what what you consider normal as part of part of you know uh, privileged access, uh, but also where where value may also lie within the attackers or the adversaries that you're looking to be able to defend against. Um, one again, trying to bring this back over to things that have happened within a recent uh, recent topic. Uh, so Colonial Pipeline. So again, this was front page news uh, uh, here in Washington, uh, here in the the United States and the East Coast. Uh, Colonial Pipeline was hit with a, uh, a ransomware attack. And so this ransomware attack obviously ultimately disrupted the gasoline uh, supply in parts of the Southeast uh, uh, and lasted about a month. Uh, with attackers able to be able to get a password to an old VPN account. So this particular legacy VPN only had single factor authentication, and it was a complicated password. Um, um, it was not, you know, password one, two, three, four. 
have a password. Uh, it was complex, um, but it's important to be able to note that even complex passwords uh, uh, are, are vulnerable to 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 cracking and to uh, 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 discovery with with enough time and effort. So if this if this VPN was protected with multi-factor authentication, it would likely would have thwarted the attackers as part of access into this into this this, this particular this particular attack attack method. Cool. All right, next slide. Continuing again with the airport met metaphor. Uh, uh, so once passengers are in the terminal, uh, there is no expectation of privacy. Uh, uh, there is a prescribed uh, pre path between the terminal and the gate, uh, and is what we would consider kind of regular traffic. So, so you you you, you go into the gate, then you go into the terminal, and terminal, and then you're proceeding through the terminal over to your boarding gate. You get on the airplane, and then you you depart over in your your destination. Um, uh, during this time, we're, at, we're we're expected to be able to act within personas. So passengers, air uh, air traffic, uh, air airport crew members, shop workers, security all follow a predefined user behavior. And so when users from a certain profile deviates, uh, uh, this requires obviously further investigation. For example, it would be sufficient uh, suspicious if a crew member used their badge to be able to access a boarding gate at the same time that they are in transit on another flight. And so this would be obviously a case of impossible travel that, that user behavior analytics would be able to identify. So you can't be in two places at the same time. Um, so, but what's important, and I know that this graphic is, is, is fairly small, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try to walk people through here. Uh, the, the, everything starts with data. So everything, so from time reporting to uh, to emails, to phone records, to uh, 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 file downloads are all, 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 it's all, it's all data. So, and so from data, uh, we move to observations. So again, we're looking at file size, we're looking at timing, we're looking at, at the, uh, uh, you know, login attempts, uh, 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 so on and so forth. And so these are all observations. And so once we have obviously raw data and we move from observations, we move to indicators. Uh, uh, so indicators are really, you know, is there a policy violation? Is there an attempt to be able to access information that's outside of your 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 need to know or your privilege to access? And so again, from 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 indicators, we move to be able to assign uh, uh, personas. So. Uh, uh, so again, something can be completely normal. You know, again, you again, kind of going back over to the to the to the airport metaphor. The the passenger will go through the gate and they'll go through the the terminal, but they they likely won't try to be able to access a restricted environment or a restricted area or a place that's outside of the their their their, their need to know or their right to be able to access. So and 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 similarly, you wouldn't see aircraft air, airport crew. Uh, who work on the on the on the ground trying to be able to access a, a, a an airplane to be able to board and sit into a seat like a passenger would. So again, you're you're assigned personas both in an airport, but also uh, uh, also with an environment as well. So as one of the, one of the important things I also wanted to be able to touch on here is really the the some additional context. It's important to be able to consider singular versus contextual assessment. So a singular threat assessment would require uh, requires uh, 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 us to be able to treat each request, uh, each uh, request individually, and does not take into consideration the subject history and consideration when making evaluations. So this can allow for obviously faster evaluations, but there is a risk that the attack can go undetected if it stays within that subject's defined role. So, for example, if an attacker steals HR credentials and then only tries to be able to attempt to access HR records, uh, uh, then obviously that falls within kind of defined persona in terms of what that that credential is able to be able to access, uh, um, and and wouldn't seem abnormal as part of the singular assessment. Um, so more difficult and uh, is is kind of the contextual assessment. So that takes into not just kind of the subject's persona, uh, but uh, but also but also the 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 agent's recent or the the, the individual's recent history. 
into consideration when evaluating access requests. So this means that the the policy enforcement, going back over to the policy enforcement policy decision point. Uh, so the policy enforcement point must maintain some sort of state information on the on on all subjects that try to be able to access that resource. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, but but maybe more likely to so from this perspective, maybe more likely to be able to detect an attacker in a pattern that is atypical of what the policy enforcement sees for for a given subject. So so the analysis of the subject behavior can can be used to be able to provide a model of acceptable use deviations from that behavior that could trigger additional authentication checks and also step up. Uh, 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 and also maybe even potentially denial of those resources as well. So, okay. uh, next slide, please. So finally, <laughs> rounding out the uh, the airport metaphor, so passengers are screened and, and authorized to be able to proceed into the terminal. However, just as with multi-factor authentication, there are there are secure enclaves within 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 a, an airport. So again, there are multiple terminals, and so sometimes you're asked to be able to re-authenticate as you move into different terminals. There are departure gates where you need to be able to provide, obviously, you know, additional uh, additional information before prior to boarding um, boarding the airplane. Yeah, customs, uh, you know, if you're traveling international, and uh, uh, there there are additional screenings as you as you're moving into the international concourse, or if you're deplaning from an international location. Um, now frequent flyer lounges uh, 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 also are, are locations where where you uh, require additional information um, uh, to be able to access. And so all these different policies relate to to gaining access. So so zero trust uh, can be implemented based upon placing uh, individuals or groups of resources on a unique network segment. Uh, protected by gateway security components. So again, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about here to the graphic to the to the left here in a minute. Um, but uh, uh, so infrastructure devices such as routers, next generation firewalls, so special purpose gateway devices to act as kind of policy enforcement points, uh, protecting each other, uh, 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 protecting each resource in a small group or related resource. Host-based micro-segmentation using software agents or firewalls on endpoint assets as well. Uh, but but it, it's important uh, uh, to be able to note that that in order for micro segmentation to be successful, an identity governance program must be sufficiently mature. Uh, uh, since the gateway components will rely on these attributes to act as a policy enforcement point. Uh, so in the diagram to the right, you know we have uh, web applications and databases are segmented with load balancers and with distributed firewalls at the perimeter of the micro segment. Uh, uh, so each of the micro segments leverages a, uh, a distributed firewall as a policy decision policy enforcement point uh, with prescribed policies allowing for only authorized traffic in and out of those segments. Uh, this, this, this significantly limits the attack surface for an adversary by making uh, lateral movement very difficult and allowing for security monitoring teams to be able to identify anomalous activities that would be considered out of the, out of the normal very, very quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, closing thoughts. Again, we 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 went we went pretty quickly here, and so I want to be able to allow for some time to be able to be able to have some Q and A. Uh, so, uh, applications uh, uh, within within zero trust principles obviously require organizational commitment. This is kind of a no brainer. So, when you're when you're looking at uh, uh, when you're looking at zero trust. It, it it does require significant top-down support because again you, you may be changing the, the the ways in which the organization is looking to be able to address security again it goes from what is what is what is what would you consider adequate security uh, for an application or a system or a data element and changing that paradigm to be able to move it over and saying uh, uh, how much risk am I willing to be able to accept as a part of part of engaging within this model so uh, so that that obviously is is top down board level uh, kind of risk appetite conversations to be able to say how do we how do we apply these in in a case by case basis um, employing zero trust still requires a risk based approach how much risk is your organization willing to be able to accept uh, so at the end of the day you know the the cure can't be worse than the disease uh, zero trust changes the paradigm again. Again, again, instead of asking for how much security is considered adequate, it asks 
how much risk am I willing to be able to accept? Uh, 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 it is a risk-based approach, and, and, and as the saying goes, the most secure computer is the one that is turned off, uh, that is unplugged, that is in a safe, that is under, you know, under a lake, you know, and guarded by sharks. And even then, there might be, uh, uh, there might be some question about how safe that computer really is, as as, as kind of a fam famous saying goes. So, so knowing that that 100% safe isn't isn't where you're, you're you're looking to be able to address. And so, as you're creeping up from zero, you know, are you willing to be able to accept 10, 20, 30, 40? You know, where where is your risk appetite as a part of that part of that? A transition. So, because you need to still you, you still need to be able to have those workstations and those applications to be able to be usable. And so, how can you? And so that 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 brings to the question is that how how do you gain buy-in uh, uh, versus versus making making security an either longer process and harder? So, implementing zero trust doesn't mean uh, no more automated updates, or it doesn't mean, uh, you know, making, you know, making the third party risk uh, 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 Q&A that, that, that goes out even longer. Uh, it, it does need to be a business centric approach with everybody going to the table to be able to say what, what is appropriate in certain in certain cases. And it's okay for you to be able to change, obviously, what the definition of, 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 of the amount of risk that you're willing to be able to accept with an appetite. Um, obviously, there needs to be a close partnership between the cybersecurity and the fraud department. So, uh, from a monitoring side, everything starts with data. So, we talked about that as part of the user behavior analytics. And so, as we move from data, we move to observations. And so, observations over to indicators. And so, indicators we assign personas. So, but but again, as 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 from the fraud department, they they you know they're 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 a consumer of this data uh, uh, and can also help to be able to manage and lead investigations on their side and so from a cybersecurity perspective there may be access to data on the IT side or on the, the the information security side that could also be be helped to be able to calibrate this specific business cases that that, that the fraud department is looking to be um, so there there also needs to be monitoring we're not just talking about humans here we're also talking about talking about machine accounts we're also talking about uh machine to machine communications and so it's important to be able to say you know it's not just kind of the user accounts that we're looking at we need to be able to look at the entirety of the of the access requests that are happening within the organization as as even if it's a you know a, 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 a you know a print server talking to a a a another machine in a different in a different vpc or vlan that that may also be you know considered not normal and so uh, we need to look at at all of the accounts and all the activity as part of that as well. Um, one of the things that I've also been thinking a lot about recently too is about uh, third parties, so including SaaS providers. Um, so the shared shared responsibility model as it relates to third party, how how does how does this equate to zero trust? Obviously, from a shared uh, from a shared responsibility model, there is uh, uh, there is some level of risk transference that happens when you move to software platform from infrastructure or managed services uh, as, as a service. So, um, so not, not to say that is antithetical uh, from, a, from a zero trust perspective, but you need to be able to have that open and honest conversation to say, okay, if we're gonna go with a managed service, how is that going to, how is that gonna affect our risk posture, risk appetite as it relates to our, our, our presence with, as it relates to zero trust? And uh, um, and so finally, and, and I think this is kind of the good news here. Uh, so most firms are already doing some of this. So again, uh, most firms are already doing elements of zero trust in some way, shape, or form. It's really about taking taking the conversation, and and again, saying how much risk am I willing to be able to accept versus uh, how what what versus you know what what is considered adequate security. Most organizations already have MFA. Most organizations are already doing some level of segmentation within organizations. Most organizations are already looking at again, if it's not if it's not fine grained, it's rough grained authentication. Looking at role based authentication, uh, uh, and so it's really looking at how can you take you know certain blocks and uh, blocking and tackling and tighten down certain areas and sufficiently to be able to address uh, uh, address work in these areas. Um, so with that, thank you. I appreciate uh, that brings me to the end of my conversation. Uh, next slide. So these are some references again. The as as you're looking at 
uh, 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 kind of where this information came from or was gleaned from again. So this is so this is uh, uh, kind of where, where some of that resources and, and contextual information on the following slides. So fine, fine. Uh, so thank you. Q and A. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for such an insightful and informative uh, session. And that was really very interesting. So before we begin with the Q&A, uh, we will be starting a short poll. So let us know if you are interested to learn more about our programs and take part in the poll. Should we start with the Q&A, John? Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. OK. Uh, the first question we have is, how to ensure that there is no weak link within employees from where there can be a threat? So one more time, can you, can you repeat that? How, how to ensure that there is no weak link within employees from where there can be a threat? So how to, so I'm gonna to try to repeat. So how, how to be able to ensure that there is no weak link within compliance uh, uh, so that, 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 that you don't have a threat. Um, so I, I think that from, you know, continuous assessment, continuous uh, improvement, uh, testing, obviously, you know, the, the, you know, we talk a little about, I talk a little bit about at the front of the, of the conversation about uh, the three lines of defense. And so obviously you've got first line, second line, and third line. So IT controls, enterprise risk management, and audit. And so these are all kind of the necessary checks and balances associated with making sure that there is a, a robustness associated with, uh, with the information security controls, uh, but to be able to, uh, to be able to identify where those where those weak links might be, but again, that's that's only part of the part of the part of the puzzle. And so again, it's that's that's reacting to obviously a deficiency that's already with the environment. And so that's important to be able to couple obviously with the um, with the target state, so the maturity. So you know where where are you driving an organization from a control perspective? How do you how do you continue to be able to implement uh, new and existing enhancing controls that that's that's consonant with the the risk posture associated with the organization, but also uh, uh, knowing that 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 innovation is going to continue to happen within your organization. So, as I like to say, innovation is inversely proportional to security. So, the more innovation that you have, uh, is that security needs to be brought along with that, uh, and not you know not not bolted on at the end. And so, it needs to be needs to have conversations at the same table to be able to say, okay, well, if we're going to go into a multi-cloud environment, or if we're going to move into uh, you know, uh, mesh networks or containerized uh, uh, applications. How is this going to change our risk appetite? And how do we need to be able to tighten down certain controls in certain areas so that that we don't inadvertently add 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 weak links to our security posture through through addressing the you know uh, 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 innovation on the other side. Good question. Thank you, John. The next question is, is there any way you could quantitatively describe waste in terms of annual cost of safeguards, ACS, or say in terms of annualized loss expectancy, et cetera? Oh, that's... <laughs> um, so th there, there are some quantitative measures for, um, uh, for, for assessing... Um, Assessing risk, and so obviously, I think that the 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 most prevalent one is FAIR, uh, and I and I can't remember exactly what FAIR stands. F A I R uh, is 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 a framework for assessing uh, uh, risk as a part of uh, uh, as a part of a a organization. Uh, one of the things that I would also um, uh, one of the things that I would also encourage people to look at. Um, is, is is how to be able to assess your technical debt within an organization too, and so uh, technical debt can also be an indicator of of of, of, of uh, weakening controls in certain areas. So again, kind of the, the the basics of cyber hygiene is you know patch and rotate passwords and and ensure that 
that you're 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 operating at the the most recent or patched uh, uh, operating system within an organization. So hopefully that, that answered your question a little bit. So, but uh, but Thayer is I think the one that kind of comes to mind first and foremost. Okay, uh, the next question we have is how to ensure zero trust when top level management is involved? Um, that's, so I think that the, uh, when top level management is involved from a, from a zero trust perspective, I think it's important to be able to, again, take it, take it to the risk appetite. So say what, what, what is the level of risk that we're willing to be able to accept here? So what is the amount of fraud that we're willing to be able to accept? So what is the amount of financial loss, you know, external financial loss or internal financial loss that we're willing to be able to accept as part of that? And then and then lead top level management through kind of those conversations to be able to say, okay, well, we're not, we don't, we're we're not, we're not, we're not willing to be able to accept any any financial loss okay well then that's your starting point in terms of designing the art designing the information security or, or the zero trust uh policies behind uh behind that so but maybe there is a maybe there's a situation where you can uh where top level management is saying we are willing to be able to accept some financial loss externally uh, externally facing uh, uh because we don't want to interrupt or impact uh 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 you know our customers unduly uh but we have we, we we don't want to face reputational impact we don't want to be able to face you know regulatory or 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 governance sanctions uh, uh as it relates to as it relates to a breach and so on and so forth and so that again that you can design your 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 security risk posture based upon uh based upon those appetite appetite definitional statements and so in some cases again it might also be the risk appetite internally might be a little bit more stringent because again if you're already inside the organization if you're already you know again kind of going back over to the insider threat uh, there might be a might be certain situations where you're designing you're designing uh controls that are uh that are that are more stringent to be able to capture or catch those 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 aspects quicker in a, in a more thoughtful and concerted area good question uh, the next question is can zero trust be implemented in each and every institution if yes what are the key requirements needed to implement the zero trust um so the answer is yes um so I, I and i think that there was kind of that last bullet in the last slide that i had is that I think that many organizations currently already have elements of zero trust uh, with, within their their organization. Again, and it's a uh, you know let's let's start with MFA. So most organizations already have multi-factor authentication within their organization. Most organizations don't uh, uh, you know don't don't uh, already have uh, uh, segmented networks uh, uh, that you know so they'll have their uh, uh, their data plane, their their application plane, their uh, security uh, 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 security data uh, uh, plane. Uh, so th there's already certain segments that have already kind of existed within organizations, and and I think that obviously there's there's already monitoring in a lot of cases. I think that it's it's taking it's taking kind of that basis and doing an assessment and saying, okay, where is my organization at? uh currently as it relates to some of these zero trust components again and flipping the conversation saying okay you know let's 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 move away from what is adequate security versus how much risk i'm willing to be able to accept in the event of a compromise in the event of a breach in the event of you know impact of confidentiality availability and integrity how much how, how much how much risk am i willing to be able to accept and then to be able to build on those existing security controls to be able to say okay in these situations we're going to accept less risk than than in uh, uh, than in some of these other applications or these other systems. Good question. Thank you, John. Uh, the next question is how to balance zero trust with business operations. <laughs> um, I think that you know, obviously, from from a zero trust perspective, and and within business operations, it's I, I think it's it, it goes hand in hand. Uh, again, it, it it does require 
Um, it does require, you know, significant um, uh, engagement with the business. It does require conversations uh, uh, so that, again, the, kind of going back over to the last slide again, is that the, the, uh, uh, the cure can't be worse than the disease. So, so what are we trying to be able to solve for? Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the most secure computer, again, is the one that's unplugged and, un, and turned off and at the bottom of a lake. And so we need to be able to say, you know, what that level of risk that we're willing to be able to accept as part of those specific use cases as part of the, the fundamental strategy in terms of, you know, protecting, uh, protecting our business. And business has to be at the table in order to be able to help us define and qualify that risk appetite. Uh, because as, as, as security professionals, uh, you know, we can we can help to be able to implement that those 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 controls and those technologies and those tools and those processes. Uh, uh, but but it needs to be articulated again from the from the business side of things to be able to say what 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 where are they willing to be able to loosen up and where are they and where are they not willing to be able to accept any risk at all. So. And it's okay for you to be able to change. Yeah, it's it, it's okay to be able to go back iteratively over to the table, you know, either on an annual or biannual or semi-annual basis to be able to say, you know, has 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 things within the market, has things within our understanding of their industry in terms of adversaries, um, to be able to be able to tighten down certain certain areas, uh, to be able to address you know emerging emerging risks. Again, I I don't think that you know two years ago, obviously ransomware was an issue, but it is not as big of an issue as it is today. So, good question. Yeah, um, we'll take one last question. Uh, how do you yeah. apply trust to a workstation where the use mm -hmm. is a local, where the user is a local admin on the device? How do you apply a zero trust on? So, so obviously there, there there would need to be two 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 sets of credentials. So the so the regular. Yeah, again, I, I think there there are not, not to get too deep into the weeds. Uh, there there are ways to be able to obviously segment the identity access management components uh, to be able to sure ensure segregation of duties uh, uh, and and allow for the user to be able to operate with a certain level of credentials at one level and then obviously a privileged access at a certain predefined period of point in time. So obviously that that individual wouldn't shouldn't 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 always log in with their uh, uh, with their privileged access, uh, uh, if if the duties that they're they're performing do not necessitate, you know, obviously that elevated privilege. Uh, but again, that that all goes back into again policies and procedure side of the side of things to be able to say there is the technical ability to be able to segment out those 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 access rights in in a meaningful and thoughtful way. But again, it it, it needs to include both people, process, and technology as well as governance to be able to ensure. That, that people are doing the right things at the right times and also training as well. So, good question. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, we got one more question. We'll take this one more question and then we'll end the session. Uh, okay. This question is, how to foresee zero trust approach in ICS, industrial computer systems? <laughs> okay. Um, so, so, I think that's, that's um, Getting a little bit outside of my frame of reference, but I'm I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna attempt to be able to answer. Uh, so from an uh, industrial control systems perspective, uh, obviously the risk appetite is going to be fairly low, uh, and typically those work, typically ICS will operate in kind of a separate or segmented uh, 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 segmented uh, network that that is that that is hopefully separate from the IT. Uh, uh, part uh, now, obviously, as you're looking at kind of the the OSI model, so uh, levels one through seven, you're looking at uh, uh, the the Purdue model, which is really kind of based upon uh, 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 operational technology. There is the there is the interface between the IT and the OT at really kind of the HMI level, and so uh, so we need to be able to make sure that we're being very thoughtful and very conscientious in how we're connecting IT to OT. Uh, uh, making sure that there is resiliency, making sure that obviously the interrogation, uh, making sure that again all those things that are appropriate in terms of authentication, fine grained, 
uh, 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 monitoring as well as appropriate network uh, as appropriate network segmentation uh, uh, to be able to keep the operational technology into you know into its its appropriate segment potentially hopefully a micro segment versus a uh, uh, versus network you know uh, you know uh, by and large network connectivity through the through the entire IT organization so but good 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 question I think that's one of the things that we're also very keen to be able to understand obviously after the colonial pipeline breach that happened as well so excellent questions thank you john uh, so now we have come to the q a session and uh, thank you so much for answering those questions and for such a great presentation john it was a real pleasure to have you with us thank you it was my pleasure as well and thank you to all the attendees who have joined the webinar and took part in the poll uh, and with this we'll end the session so you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you once again.